All right, thank you. Um, my name is Jonathan Freebert, and we're very excited to have with us uh, Kim Nelson today. Kim is the Executive Director of eGovernment Solutions, as well as the Executive Director of the U.S. Public Sector State and Local Government Solutions team. Uh, Kim has an extensive resume. One thing I did want to highlight in her role um, at Microsoft is that she works with the Microsoft Partner Ecosystem to help partners uh, realize public sector opportunities. And this is something she's going to spend some time talking to, to you all about. Uh, so Kim has been with Microsoft since uh, 2006. Prior to that, uh, she spent 26 years in the public sector, 22 years with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and then four as the first U.S. Senate confirmed presidential appointee to serve as Assistant Administrator for Environmental Information and Chief Information Office in the U.S. EPA. So with that, um, I'm very pleased and excited to uh, introduce Kim Nelson. And uh, what we'll do is we'll have Kim present. And then if you have any questions, please, uh, if you're on link, type them into the IM box or at the end of her presentation, uh, if you can ask your question, if you would just uh, state your name and where you're from, that would be great. So with that, Kim. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, Jonathan, I'll rely on you if there are questions to, to prompt me since I'm doing a full screen display here. I will do that. <laughs> so thank you, those of us uh, joining us today. Uh, hopefully, wherever you are, it is uh, warmer and drier than, than uh, it is in the Northeast for the last couple of days. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, just cover a few topics today, just a little bit of background in terms of the work that we're doing here at Microsoft, particularly as it relates to our, our partners. I'm going to talk about our Microsoft Government Cloud, because it is our priority for our government customers and our partners. Uh, I'll dive a little bit into specifically uh, our Azure Government Solutions and what that means and why it's important. Uh, to our customers. I'll talk a little bit about our independent software vendors and, and other partners, and then uh, a little overview of our government, our, our government partner program. <clears throat> so the, uh, everything at Microsoft today in the U.S. public sector, um, as well as the company in general, is really about how we transform our customers, and particular government, into a mobile first, cloud first world. Um, that's what you're here constantly from Microsoft, and, and that's our focus as a company. Um, I think somebody, if somebody could go on mute, I do hear a little background noise. Um, so if everybody could go on mute, that would be great for, uh, for others. So I, I mentioned I'll provide a little background in terms of our government cloud. Uh, this is what really enables our mobile first cloud first world. And today, uh, as of today, uh, we are now the only company that has a government cloud that meets all government certifications for Office 365, which is Productivity Suite. That's our, for those of you know, our email, our office products, our, our instant mes messaging and collaboration. Uh, CRM Online, which is our platform for constituent relationship management or case management uh, that we use uh, across many, many government entities. And Azure. Azure is the platform where we have infrastructure in the cloud for building applications. And we're going to get in a little bit more into that. Uh, the specifics about our Microsoft Government Cloud, I'm not going to touch on all of these pillars here, but there are some that are particularly important to us. Um, the first one, the blue one, the most complete cloud designed for government. I'll talk a little bit more about that. This is, this is an unparalleled statement, because as I just mentioned, we've got uh, CRM in a cloud, Office 365, and Azure, the government platform. No other company has that. It is a the platform meets the most rigorous security and, and compliance requirements of our government customers, both at the federal level and the state level. And I will get into that in a little bit more detail. These are the things that really distinguish us from anybody else that's offering cloud services today. And this is our focus area for the partners with whom we work who are developing solutions for our government customers. The reason uh, I made the statement about uh, being unparalleled in terms of meeting the security requirements, Microsoft made a commitment uh, 
because we are an enterprise company and because we support large enterprises like the federal government, uh, like our state government customers, to meet the security requirements and the certifications that our government customers uh, require. And here's a handful of those certifications. For those of us who are working in government today, some of these are going to sound very familiar to you. If you're in the federal government, you know the Fed ramp right there in the middle is the most important certification that cuts across all of the federal agencies. That if, you, if you're a federal agency and you want to use cloud service, you have to be certified by the federal government. Even in state and local government, we find many state or local government agencies find it easy to put a requirement in a procurement that says any cloud service should meet FedRAMP certifications rather than having something on their own. Uh, on the far left, you see the CJIS, Criminal Justice Information System. In state and local government, this is really one of our most important certifications. It is uh, something that affects all law enforcement criminal justice agencies that interact with the FBI. And the reason this one is so important is because it is, frankly, has been the hurdle uh, to many of our state and local government customers moving to the cloud, or even some of our competitors. Uh, our competitors may have uh, certain customers in cities move to the cloud, but the law enforcement agency will not move because they didn't meet CJIS requirements. Today, Microsoft is the only company where we allow, because of the, the, the way we implement our government cloud, where we allow our customers to meet their CJIS requirements. And what that means is, at our Microsoft government data centers, we have two of them that are specifically dedicated to our government customers. Our, our employees are background checked, they're fingerprinted, they're under constant video surveillance. Our data centers get uh, inspected by the state police to ensure they meet the criminal justice information standards. And then we sign an agreement with the state, uh, the, the highest law enforcement agency in the state, that says we meet their standard, and then that then applies to every other law enforcement agency in the, in, the, in the state. So no other technology company has done that with uh, their government customers. And no other technology company has agreed to have their people fingerprinted, background checked, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this just shows the momentum that we have with our Azure uh, or with our government cloud uh, across the board. There are many people who often say, Government is slow to adopt new technologies. That has not been the case in state and local government when it comes to the cloud. A lot of people say that uh, government customers don't want to move to the cloud. That is not true. We see tremendous momentum. As you can see, there are over 3 million Office 365 government customers today. About 2 million of those are actually in state and local government. So. We have seen a huge interest, uh, particularly around Office 365, with our government customers moving to the cloud. So um, they are not slow to adopt this new technology. So what are some of the things people are doing in the cloud? So besides Office 365, I'm going to talk to you about sort of some of the specific areas. And I'm not going to go deep on this slide. I'm not even going to talk about all the different um, areas. But the, when we talk about Azure, so keep in mind, when I talk about the cloud, I'm always going to be talking about three different aspects of it. Office 365, that's the productivity stuff. I'm going to talk about Azure, that's, think of it as the data center in the cloud for hosting applications and for infrastructure. And then there's CRM online, which is comparable to you know, salesforce.com kind of activity. So these kinds of solutions here that you see here are the kinds of things people are using Azure in our government cloud. These are the sales motions, if you will, that we're pursuing. So if you are a partner and you want to do business in state and local government, and you want to work closely with our teams here and align with what Microsoft is doing and our sales teams are doing, these are the these are the areas that are sweet spots for you if you want to work and drive uh, uh, any 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 workloads around Azure. These are basically horizontal kinds of workloads, more generic workloads. 
Uh, these are generally workloads that you might, you would generally um, target to a CIO in a state or a, or a city. The last one, deliver audio and video at scale, is a little different. And the reason that's a little different is, uh, I'll get to in a little bit more detail later, is because that's a message we're actually taking directly to law enforcement. And you'll see why. So um, what we're talking about here is when, when we uh, work, when we talk to our government customers about the Azure cloud for US public sector, there are some things that are really important for them to know. And I already touched on a few of those. Um, and, but uh, the one thing I, I forgot to mention was that um, in addition to you know, screening our personnel and, and storing the data in the United States, we do make sure that the data is physically isolated from any other data or any other customers that might be using the Microsoft Azure cloud. So again, just because it's something that's really important to our government customers, you know, their data is isolated, it stays in the United States, it's secure because of the fingerprinting and background checking. So, so these are all the standards that are important to our government customer. So uh, two slides ago, I talked about some of the sort of horizontal areas uh, that were the, the target areas that Microsoft was pursuing with our partners to get customer workloads in Azure. These are the ones, though, that might be of greater interest to you. These are the vertical spaces. And this is actually the, the area where my team works the most, most significantly. So my team is made up of three different vertical areas where you see that blue circle. Health and Human Services, Government Administration and Finance, and Justice and Public Safety. That far left one, National Security and Defense, is purely a federal experience. Uh, so in state and local government, we're not focusing on that. So my team is made up, as I said, of these three vertical areas. I have an executive director for Health and Human Services, an executive director for Government Administration and Finance, and an executive director for Justice and Public Safety. Each one of those individuals is supported by a, a technical resource. And then in addition to that, we have marketing resources that support our team. We have partner resources that support our team, all driving vertical solutions in these spaces. Now, Two slides ago, when I talked about those horizontal solutions, for instance, and I mentioned the video um, uh, area. One of the reasons video is so important to us, to give you an example on sort of each one of these areas, the kinds of work that my team does. So in the justice and public safety space, um, you probably, you would, you would have to have just, you know, landed uh, here from spending a, a year on the moon to not know that issues like body-worn cameras are, are one of the most uh, frequently cited news stories uh, in the news today as a result of incidents around the country. Uh, the president has actually proposed hundreds of millions of dollars for body-worn cameras. Uh, we just learned this morning, actually, the Department of Justice is even moving ahead and faster than Congress uh, with a multi-million dollar grant program to uh, police departments that have body-worn camera solutions. So the reason, the reason this is in a, a solution area for us, there are companies out there who make dashboard cameras, body-worn cameras, surveillance cameras that have been around for years, all kinds of technologies, particularly in the law enforcement and surveillance space, using video cameras. And law enforcement agencies have important decisions to make with this video. It's, first of all, it's a monumental amount of video. Um, every single body-worn camera, every single uh, car with a dashboard uh, uh, camera uh, can generate uh, an incredible amount of, of data every year, and depending on how long they store it, that's, that's another issue our, our customers have to deal with. So they're generating an increasing amount of, 
of data, about a terabyte of data for every body-worn camera or dashboard camera. They then have to decide how long do they keep it, do they need to maintain it uh, for pending cases, you know, where do they store it, how do they, make, how do they keep it, how do they secure it, all of these issues have to be dealt with. Once it's stored, could there possibly be Freedom of Information Act issues? For instance, in Seattle, they believe there, there are Freedom of Information Act issues where people have come forward and asked for copies of every single video that the law enforcement agencies have, have stored. And so then the FOIA issue becomes, well, just like any, any documents that get FOIAed, you have to redact certain information, privacy information. Well, if, what do you do with video? How do you redact? Maybe uh, faces in there that don't need to be in there because they weren't part of the, the incident that the police department showed up at somebody's house about. So there's, a, 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 like any emerging technology, we are facing huge, not only technology issues, but significant policy and legal issues as well. So. What my team does is, is work uh, with our partners who are developing these solutions to, to um, uh, ensure that these kinds of solutions are on the Microsoft platform and that our Microsoft tools and technologies uh, are enabled to, to support these new demands coming and new needs coming from our customers. So uh, to, to carry this video example further, what we're doing with partners, we probably have about a dozen of them today in the justice and public safety space who are uh, companies that support law enforcement agencies with video cameras. They could be body-worn cameras, dashboard cameras, and the like. Um, they are moving their solutions to our Windows Azure platform. The reason, government, the reason that, again, is significant, a reminder that we are the only one that is criminal justice information certified. So that means the data can be stored in our cloud and the law enforcement agencies can still interact with the FBI justice systems. So we're, we're meeting the CJIS certification and because we're now in the space, we are developing further multimedia capabilities that make it easier for our government customers to manage the data once the, the video, once they get it in the cloud. How do you, just like a sort of a, a library system, how do you check the data in? How do you check the, the video in? How do you check it out? How do you ensure that there's a chain of custody around it? All of those issues that are important to our customers. These, these are the areas where my team would drill deep, working with our partners and working with Microsoft because some of this would be functionality the partners would do, some of it would be functionality Microsoft might want to build on its end, on its platform, to make it more um, uh, conducive to, to government customers using. So that's, that's on the justice and public safety space, just, just sort of an interesting tidbit. Um, one of the reasons video is so important to us is because, again, there's just so much of it. When, when Microsoft was creating the Microsoft Azure platform, the commercial cloud platform, um, it did work with Hollywood, and there are media services in Azure. But the, and, and so they worked with Hollywood, thinking Hollywood was the biggest producer of video. In actuality, the law enforcement agencies in the United States today, and the prediction in the future, because the number of body-worn cameras that are growing and dashboard cameras are growing, um, far exceeds anything that Hollywood produces in terms of video today. So it's a, it's a huge market for us. And these, these are the kinds of vertical areas we look to. Um, so there, there are other areas in justice and public safety we're working, we're working, and, and you, I, I've provided a slide later, you'll see some of those. I won't go in on depth, depth, but you'll have access to this deck, so you'll see the kinds of things we do. Um, I'll, on the health and human services front, I would say the, the bulk of our work there is around case management. Um, if you look across our government agencies, uh, whether it's uh, agencies that support children, or uh, families, um, or you know, women, women, infant, and children, you know, food programs, um, uh, disability programs. There's there's a case management component to many of those, and that's that's our primary target with our health and human services business. More on the social service case management side around eligibility and case management, less on the health side. Within Microsoft, 
I think everybody knows we do have a larger health organization that deals with health care providers and insurance providers. We're dealing here in state and local government with those entities that provide those social services. On the government administration um, vertical, we, we tend to, and I, I usually take that one last because uh, the reason being we everybody really understands what health and human services it is. Everybody understands what justice and public safety is. Our, our, our e-government or our government administration finance vertical is a little bit of whatever doesn't fit in the other two verticals. And, and it's an important place to say um, Microsoft and our solutions uh, team will never be all things to all people. We don't try to be. There are about 400,000 partners in the Microsoft ecosystem today. Uh, we can't work with all 400,000 of them. Our approach to working with our government customers is about how do we, how do we work with government customers that um, are building, how do we work with our government customers that have emerging kinds of needs, newer, newer needs, and how do we work with partners who are trying to address those emerging needs on newer technologies. So my team is usually at the, the tip of the spear, if you will, in terms of the kinds of problems government entities are facing and the kinds of solutions our partners are building to address those needs. And that's how we scope out and keep this manageable. Uh, one of the interesting things we're doing in the government administration space today, for instance, um, timely, it's, you know, we're leading up to a presidential election, is the fact that if you if you everybody on this call probably has voted at, at one time or another, um, and if if you live in a state where you don't vote by mail and you actually go to a polling place or you remember a time when you did go to a polling place, uh, you remember that there are there are machines throughout the polling place. Uh, most of those machines were purchased uh, over a decade ago with federal funds, Help America Vote Act funds. Those machines tend to be highly proprietary machines. They're very expensive to buy. They're very expensive to maintain. They're usually big and bulky and cumbersome to move around. We are working uh, with a, a couple of partners today who are looking at, at simply replacing proprietary voting machines out there with Windows 8 tablets. Windows 8 tablets come in all shapes and sizes. Um, they can display a ballot just as well as anything else and are much more cost effective and uh, easy to use and easy to replace, easy to store, um, and easy to maintain and transport. So we're, we're looking at uh, how, do we, how do we get as many Windows 8 devices in polling places today to replace the older proprietary equipment. So that's that's an overview. Um, there are some deeper examples of what the team does, but to to sort of recap there, um, and I'm gonna I want to I want you to see the resources we have on the team. So uh, the. The solutions team that I run that focuses in those three areas is pretty unique within Microsoft and uh, it's unique because of the, the approach that we take. Uh, we do change our focus on a, on a yearly basis uh, because as I said we try to focus on the emerging problems of our government customers as well as the emerging products Microsoft is using. Uh, this, this, this org chart looks a little distorted but uh, it gives you a sense of the resources we have at our disposal and, and perhaps more important, um, even beyond my team at the top, which was those top two rows that I already described, the, the executive directors that we have and then the architects in the space, um, are the resources at the bottom. So we have on the left side, we have marketing resources, uh, marketing resources that focus on JPS, that focus on health and human services, that focus on partner marketing. There in the lower column, in the lower left, you see Maureen Mascara. Her role is specifically to work with my team on those partners that have solutions uh, that, that drive our, our, our most important product. On the right, we have two new resources that are part of our partner executive team. And the role they, these two women play, but Seema and Michelle, are to our partner sales execs. So what they do is they work with our account teams across the country in terms of 
uh, making sure the account teams are aware of all the solutions that are developed by our partners and help sell those solutions. So a lot of resources at the disposal for our partners. Um, I already I mentioned um, in our mission that our team is a little different. I think uh, this, this describes well how we, we really do take a different approach. So if on the top you, you look at the typical product teams or sales teams within Microsoft, uh, who cover the country, and we have great sales coverage, um, they're either horizontally focused, where they're focused on a product. We have people out there who are just out there to sell Azure, or just out there to sell Dynamic CRM, or just out there to sell SQL. Um, or they could be regionalized. They could be the account exec for the city of Philadelphia, or the account exec for the state of Florida. And therefore, they're covering all the, the accounts in that territory. But they generally just have a, a state, right? One or two states. Um, the difference with my team is we, my team covers the whole country. We work with all of the account execs out there. We're about, as I said before, solving solving the problems, the business problems of our government customers. And we have that vertical focus. And we bring expertise to the table. We bring people to the table that actually have deep vertical expertise. Jeff Friedman, for instance, who runs our, our government space, just came to us last April from uh, Mayor Nutter's office in the city of Philadelphia. Rick Zach, who runs uh, our, our uh, justice and public safety space, uh, is a, a firefighter uh, in, in his past and in his spare time today in his community. And what we do is we're not just interested in selling Microsoft product. We're interested in pairing the product with the intellectual property created by our partners to create an end-to-end -end solution. So, Everything we do will align with the, the mobile first, cloud first strategy within Microsoft. Essentially what we look to do when we create solutions is we want a solution that's on the cloud. Okay, So we're not interested in too many traditional on-premises solutions um, that somebody's going to run in their own data center. We want it in the cloud. Um, we try to incorporate uh, our productivity capabilities or some kind of social aspect into the solution, um, that's lowest on the priority list, I would say. Very high on the priority list is including in any solution um, some kind of business intelligence or business insights. Microsoft has very strong tools today for visualizing business insights. And if you look at what a lot of our customers need today, whether they're doing social service case management or they're doing public safety, whatever, you know, it's, it's really about understanding, getting business insights out of all the data they're generating. So that's a key component of the solutions that we try to drive. And then we, tr we always try to have a, a device or, or mobile um, component to it. Case managers in the field, firefighters in the field, uh, law enforcement on the beat with a device that gives them access to information. They're, they're the kinds of um, uh, things that we try to build in that end-to-end -end solution. I've been working with partners at Microsoft uh, since 2006, since I came here from the federal government. And I can honestly say this, is, this year is a turning point. Micro partners have always been important to Microsoft. As I said, we have about 400,000 of them around the world. Um, it's Microsoft's revenue, I'm not sure how many people realize it, but about 97% of our revenue come through partners. Um, that's the way we sell everything is through partners. But this year really marks um, a, a changing point for the focus Microsoft is putting on ISVs, independent software vendors, those partners who are developing their own intellectual property on our platform. And just back in December, Kevin Turner, our, our CEO, put out a message about this very specific focus Microsoft is having on ISVs. And I, I, I now share this with all the partners with whom we work. It's one of the reasons we have so many resources this year that I just showed to you, the, the partner sales exec, the marketing um, resources. We're now getting additional resources from an organization within Microsoft called DX. It used to be called um, DEP, developer, um, uh, or DPE, Developer Platform Evangelist. Uh, today they're called DX, the Developer Experience. But, but in essence, um, there is a, a clear understanding 
um, that where Microsoft is going in this mobile first, cloud first world is really about um, accelerating our company's position to being the productivity and platform company in, in this mobile first, cloud first world. We need and want everybody out there building their solutions on our platform. So we're expanding the focus um, of our, our developer experience team um, to, to really support uh, ISVs out there who want to build on our platform. And our target out there are existing partners with whom we're working who have had maybe custom .NET applications that are running on-premise someplace and migrating those to a cloud platform. Our focus is on our competitors, people who have never worked on the Microsoft platform, never developed on the Microsoft platform. Uh, we want them on our platform today. And today, that platform is much more open than it was in the past. I didn't. There, there are way too much information to go over today, but our, our Microsoft Azure platform is not a proprietary platform in the sense that you have to build straight Microsoft. We're, we run Oracle in Azure. We run SAP in our Azure platform. We run open source Linux in our Azure platform. So we're really out there recruiting and engaging the developer community who has never even worked on, on the Microsoft platform before, because maybe they've worked on Linux and an open source. Maybe they're just Oracle developers. All those things run in Azure today. So uh, that's who we're recruiting, our traditional partners and migrating them to the cloud, as well as our non-traditional partners that never worked on Microsoft. We run in the cloud. This is an, ex this is, um, an, an eye chart with a lot of icons. Um, the reason this is significant, when we launched on December 9th our Microsoft Azure Government Cloud for, uh, for Azure as well as Office 365 and announced CRM Online, uh, but specifically the Microsoft Azure Government Cloud, um, general availability on December 9th of last year, these were all the partners who were in the preview program. These were partners who started sometime back in, in June all the way through up until December came into the preview program, a sort of a beta program, to actually uh, test and run their applications in Azure Gov because we wanted to be able to demonstrate when we announced general availability um, that we, we, we had um, uh, not only tested the application clearly and put it through beta, um, but we had significant momentum, as you can see, from well over 100 different partners who were already in the government cloud. So it was, a, it was a big day for Microsoft in terms of the announcement. These partners will also play a very non-traditional role. And this is sort of um, a, a little topic I want to cover. So the, the partners that you see on the slide, um, I'm not going to go into these three areas, but they're HHS and eGov and public safety. They're the detailed uh, areas that those partners cover for different kinds of solutions on our platform. But you, you'll get access to the stack. Um, but those partners are partners that are providing solutions. And, and just after I cover the city next portion, I'm going to talk to you about the ongoing relationship Microsoft will have with these partners that's very different than anything in the past. So from a, a programmatic perspective, I, I want to finish before I get into the, the partner uh, space in more detail. I want to finish on one area that's an important priority for Microsoft. <clears throat> and that's a program we call Microsoft City Next. So um, I talked about our three vertical areas, HHS, HHS JPS, and eGov. Um, this is sort of, this is a, another area that tends to cut across all three. And it's an initiative called Microsoft City Next. It's something we launched 18 months ago. It's Microsoft's focus on cities. We recognize that in today's environment, cities are increasingly important. Um, the population in cities is growing significantly. Uh, for the first time ever last year, uh, the population in, in cities uh, exceeded that uh, globally of, of the population in uh, uh, non-urban areas. 
the from a GDP perspective, you know, 70, depending on where you are, 70-80% of all GDP activity comes out of cities, 70-80% uh, of all energy usage, you know, comes from uh, people living in cities. So uh, increasingly in the United States we see uh, city leaders who have uh, uh, significant political presence um, as leaders, so it's, cities are a very important important focus in our state and local government business. Uh, thus, uh, the worldwide public sector and Microsoft launched our what we call our City Next program 18 months ago. City Next is really, um, again, the Microsoft's emphasis on partners will come across, across loud and clear here again. It's a partner-led solution um, selling approach for Microsoft. In, in essence, uh, we have identified well over um, 120 different kinds of solutions that our partners have that meet city needs. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we're doing is positioning our partners with our city customers to help drive what we think are the top priorities for our, for our city customers, which is more modern cities, healthier cities, better educated cities, um, and safer cities. So uh, around those four core pillars, healthier, safer, uh, better educated, more modern, are well over, as I said, 120 some different partner solutions. And our approach to City Next is basically individually, it's not, it's, this is not a solution in a box, this is not a silver bullet, this is not something we go and give to cities. It is an approach to selling, but what we generally do is we, as, a, as an account team, we bring all of the Microsoft resources together in a city, and we've done this in about a dozen cities so far, whether it's our state and local government uh, resources, or education, or our corporate resources who serve our commercial, or our commercial teams. It could be our retail stores where we have cities, um, our, our government affairs team. We bring them together, we try to identify the priorities in the city, and then we align Microsoft resources to those priorities. Some of those resources are value-added resources, our citizenship kinds of programs, but others are our partner solutions to meet those needs. And then we we sort of we act as the um, the, the matchmaker there, uh, working with our, our government customers and working with the leaders in those cities to say, how can Microsoft be a strategic partner for you in the city? So uh, it, it, our, our partners love this approach. They get featured on a page called Microsoft City Next. Uh, our customers can find partner solutions there, and it's, it's been a very successful approach for us to better define what our partners can do for our customers. So there's, um, there's a lot going on um, with, within Microsoft, I think you can see, and the work that we're doing with our partners. It's, um, it's a changing world out there, and as I said, Microsoft knows it's a changing world, and, and there are new opportunities for our partners that just didn't exist before. Our customers want to buy software as a service solutions. So this provides the perfect opportunity for our partners out there to develop those solutions and to develop those solutions on our platform. The nice part about the approach with the, with the customers wanting to buy a SaaS solution is that with Microsoft now focusing on, those, uh, the, on the ISVs out there, um, we are providing additional support to get, like I said, older solutions onto the cloud uh, we're providing resources for our partners uh, through, bar through marketing and through sales um, to help sell those solutions that the customers want to buy the SaaS solutions. And we're, we're looking for ways to make it easier for our customers to buy ISV solutions. I'd say this is one of our biggest hurdles. Um, our customers can buy Microsoft technologies today. <clears throat> we have state contract, you know, in every in every location, or we have local contracts. Anything they want to buy from us, they can buy from us. What's what's a challenge though is um, if they they see a partner that has a solution on a platform. For some of our smaller partners who are trying to break in the SLG market, it's not always easy because you're not all on these state contracts. So there's a couple things we're doing. Um, one is 
we're working with a group called U.S. Communities. U.S. Communities is a consortium of counties and cities and their procurement officers. They have uh, a consortium contract that over 50,000 cities and counties across the country use. Once one city or county gets a, a, a product on a contract, one city, once one city or county competes and gets a product on, on that contract, anybody else in the country can buy off of it without competing again. So we have been working with them. Fairfax County, back in October, put out the first ever solutions RFP. Because traditionally, the U.S. Communities contract is used for more commodity kind of services. If you want to buy salt, if you want to buy pencils, if you want to buy carpet, things like that. Uh, but Fairfax County actually put an RFP on the street on behalf of U.S. Communities and said, just come to us with your innovative solutions. And they listed about 20 different kinds of things as examples. But they said, don't limit yourself to that. Come to us with any innovative solution. Now, they're still in the evaluation phase, and we, you know, we hope to see what they'll, they come out with. Um, shortly, but once they once they announce and approve the vendors and the the, the providers for those innovative solutions, um, they'll be on the U.S. Communities contract, and 50,000 entities across the nation can buy those. And based on our communication with U.S. Communities, we think they'll open that up about every six months. So you know, if you missed that, and a lot of people did, um, in no, in October. Uh, actually, the, the due date, with the, they announced in October, due date was December to submit the proposals. They plan to open that up again, assuming this was successful, and they've told me they think it was successful, and they will, uh, about every six months. So look for contracts like that to make it easy uh, to buy. We're actually working with our retail stores. Uh, we, something a little innovative here, but we had one partner, iRecord, actually put their solution on a Surface device and sell it through one of our stores, and we're looking at how we can do that in the future. There's some, like everything else, some legal issues we have to deal with, uh, but we're working with the stores and hoping, hope to have more announcements about that coming forward. And official app stores. Quite frankly, Microsoft has been way behind the curve in terms of having real app stores um, to make it easy for, for customers to uh, 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 find, uh, try, and buy uh, potential solutions out there. So there's there's more coming down the pike on that. We do have a, a, a dynamic CRM app store, but we're looking at fully aggregating this across the company to make it easier for people to buy our partner-led solutions. So um, if you're in this space and if you want to have um, solutions that you're putting on Azure Gov, just a few things I want to go through in the next five minutes, and then we're going to have time for questions. So um, again, important, if, you're, if you want to build a solution on Azure Gov, then you have to have a customer who's a U.S. government entity. You, as a partner, um, have to be providing support to a U.S. government customer, uh, or you have to be a commercial entity that meets certain re government regulations, like ITAR regulations around you know, trafficking issues. The 99% of all of our partners are going to fit in category one or two, I would imagine. If you, if you think you fit into number three, uh, we can talk about that. But most of them are going to be one or two. These are customers, uh, actual state or local government customers, and the partners who are providing support to the state and local government customers. So Microsoft has announced for the first time for these partners that went through the preview program, that slide where you saw 100 different icons, and anybody who's developing solutions on the Microsoft Azure government platform going forward, we have announced a brand new program. It's called a managed service provider. And these are people who are creating solutions and applications that are on the Azure platform. So what this means is this really puts you out in front with your customer in terms of selling your solution. Remember I said to you before, we know sometimes it's not easy. Um, and we're looking for ways to make it easier for you. But what this does is it allows you to, to deliver, to, to build applications and to deliver them on the Azure platform. Um, it means that you become the primary uh, partner working with your government customer. You don't need Microsoft in the middle. And it means you can offer a managed service to your government customer. 
again, most of our government customers are looking for that end-to-end -end solution. They don't want to have to deal with maybe buying the infrastructure themselves, supporting the application themselves, buying, buying your solution from them. You can package the whole thing. That's why it's called Managed Service Provider. In essence, and I'll get to that, Microsoft will be billing you for your Azure. So instead of the customer buying the Azure and you're just running an application on Azure, you, you're going to run your application on Azure. You can create a single price and sell a, your solution via, you know, however you want to your government customer. We know this is um, something new. So there's also some, in terms of our, our partners being able to do this, um, take an application and bundle it and sell just a complete software as a service application running in our platform without Microsoft being in the middle. So I'll just finish by saying we've also introduced something that's new. And that means if you want to become a managed service provider, there's a process you can go through and you'll see that. But you don't even have to buy the Azure services in bulk. You can buy a zero commit. If it's a brand new SKU, it's a zero commit SKU. And it just means you have an enterprise agreement with Microsoft. Um, you don't even have to commit to buying any Azure upfront. You would just get billed on a quarterly basis after the fact. And then you can decide how you want to bill your customers in terms of uh, what service you've provided to them on Azure. So I will, I will finish there. There's a process to go through. If you want to become a managed service provider, you basically get approved internally by Microsoft. As I said, we, we only allow people on the Azure government platform who are uh, partners who are serving U.S. government customers and are U.S. government entities. Um, you get approved internally. And then what we do is we put you in touch with a, a licensed service provider who would uh, work with you to have to create an enterprise agreement. And you could decide how you wanted to buy Azure uh, in terms of uh, how, how you want to you know, build your solution, how much you need, how you would package it to sell to your customer. So Jonathan, I'm going to stop there so we Thank leave enough can. time for questions. Yeah, so, thank for, so first of all, thank you again for doing this. That was extremely informative. I just wanted to let you know I've received a few emails from some very interested and excited partners that, that are looking Good. to follow up with you. But there were a few questions I just wanted to get to okay. um, in the remaining few minutes. So first of all, uh, there was a question about where um, SIs fit into all this. Uh, you mentioned ISVs. Yep. There's, there's just a question about SIs and opportunities for SIs. Great question. Um, if, you, if you go back and you think about that chart that I put up there, uh, when we had our preview program, there were actually a number of systems integrators there. Um, uh, we had Lockheed Martin, Hitachi, uh, Accenture, Deloitte, um, CGI, so lots of SIs. Uh, are, are in our government preview program. SIs can become managed service providers as well. <coughs> That's not a problem. Many of them are going through that process to do so. And in fact, I'm actually having this conversation with DX now, our developer experience program. They, they as, a, as an organization, are predominantly focused on ISVs. And the reason we say ISVs, <coughs> excuse me, it's because the ISVs are the ones that are building intellectual property on our platform. They're the ones that are creating software solutions. Many of the, you know, as compared to an SI that's uh, more, that may be simply selling services, right? Consulting services. So um, the, the point of the matter is, even in state, in particularly in state and local government, many SIs, systems integrators, act as what we call IS, ISVs because they are developing repeatable solutions. They have IP, they develop repeatable solutions, and they're selling those solutions. So in, 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 in many areas here, I, you know, you noticed I often said partners. I didn't, I didn't focus exclusively on ISV. So many, almost everything I talked about here, the same holds true whether it's an SI or an ISV. Great. Thank you, Kim. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I'm going to group together a couple mm -hmm. of questions here because uh, they relate to people. Like we had some people join us who are outside the U.S. So one is, uh, do you have an equivalent team in the U.K.? Uh, and then secondly, um, do you does an ISV have to be U.S.-based to participate in these programs? Yeah. So um, it, the first question, do I have an equivalent in the U.K.? Uh, there, are, there are 
people who do work similar to what I do almost in, in every major geography around the world. So I can put you in touch with some someone in the UK, particularly with the City Next program. Microsoft City Next is a global program. I am the US lead for the Microsoft City Next program. I do have a direct counterpart in other parts of the geography specifically for Microsoft City Next. So I can provide that uh, uh, connection as well as just generally somebody who's focused more on um, vertical solutions in the UK. So yes. Now, in terms of these programs, um, just, just like I said, some of these, like City Next, are global programs for Microsoft. The, the Microsoft Government Cloud is US only. And in order to qualify to use the Microsoft Government Cloud, you do have to be a, a US government customer or a partner who is providing services to a US government customer. And for those companies, partners that are providing services to US government customers, we do have to put them through a validation process to ensure that they fit under the official definition of a US person. So in essence, they have to have some US presence in order to be allowed to uh, have access to the government cloud. That's how we protect it and ensure that we keep our certifications for CGIS and, and DISA and other important uh, certifications. Great, thank you. Um, we have a few few more questions. Um, let me let me just ask uh, ask one more because we're a bit over time, and then uh, for follow up, if if people would like to follow up. Uh, we can I can take them in email um, so there was a question about and I want to make sure I'm getting this correct Luke but there's a question about um, getting certified at the national level and does Microsoft provide any help for where or how to do that and I'm, I want to make sure I'm getting this correct um, I'm just reading what, what Luke was writing uh, applications that are certified by government to meet cloud requirements. I believe I believe that's what you're asking. Is that if that's correct, Luke? Yeah, that's correct. It's it's uh, the underlying cloud may be certified, but our application would need to be certified on top of it. Okay. So thank you. Yeah, that 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 is an excellent question. So you're right. Microsoft meets all those certifications. <clears throat> if you if you too need to meet certain certifications. And I'll, the place this most hap happens most often is in state and local government. So if you have to, you're working and you're providing support to a customer that requires CGIS certification, right? Then you too would have to sign the same CGIS addendum with the customer for your portion of the application that's on Azure. If the customer requires that. Um, you know, in a lot of these other areas, they're just going to be happy that the platform itself is certified and won't require the partners to do anything above and beyond that. Great. Uh, that, that's not been our experience. I mean, we would, you know, the uh, cloud doesn't want to deal with the hassle, so they would like to just buy something that's already certified um, in advance. I, I only caught a portion of that. but. I mean, ours, our portion is certified, but we can't, Microsoft can't certify or anything that's built on top of it. Uh, I understand that. The question is whether Microsoft provides any assistance to help the Azure-based applications get certified. So it depends on which certification you're talking about. Are you talking about CGIS? Sure, that would be a fine example. So, so this is brand new, and actually we started talking about this. We are looking at how do we create a process that, yes, would make it easier for any of our partners that are building um, applications on the platform that require CGIS certification? We are looking at a way to see if we can make that more repeatable and easier for, for our partners. But it's, you know, we're brand new. We're only in this a month. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you again, Kim, uh, for your time, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, if you have additional, I, I, there were a few questions I didn't get to, so if you have additional questions, 
uh, please email me. My email is jfreeb at microsoft.com. Um, and we will, as Kim mentioned, we'll provide the deck and I will also provide a recording of this uh, as well online. So um, thank you again uh, for joining uh, and please uh, get involved with Voices for Innovation. Our website is www.voicesforinnovation.org and there's some great opportunities to uh, watch some of our other webinars that we've hosted uh, to get involved on some of our uh, issues and we've just launched a new blog so um, you know we would encourage you to come and read that and share it if you find it valuable with your networks and Jonathan so, feel free yeah. to copy me so they have my contact when you send it out absolutely Kim I yes. will do that all right okay. Thanks, thank everyone. you everybody all right bye-bye